in Canada, parents, families uh, were out in the street protesting because of things that are being taught to their children in school, some of it without their knowledge, far less their consent. It's interesting in many ways that to the fore were Muslim families saying that they objected to government insistence that their children's education about these and other matters was none of their business. Um, it's a controversial topic, to say the least. Joining me now to consider the issue is Canadian journalist David Creden of the Post Millennial. David, thanks for joining me. Real pleasure to be here, Neil. Uh, David, actually, before we get into the before we get into the the schools protest, the families protest. Uh, I mentioned uh, earlier on the ovation for the Nazi in the Canadian Parliament, and I think your publication broke that story. We were the first publication in Canada to talk about it, yes. And it was with a little trepidation that I wrote the story and sent it to my editor because we didn't have 100% of the facts. But I know enough about that history. And the first thing I noticed was that why were we honoring anybody who was fighting the Russians during the Second World War when the Russians were our allies? Canada, the United States, Great Britain, other Commonwealth countries were allied with Russia at that time. So obviously this guy was not fighting on our side. And I said, there's something wrong here. And of course, any subsequent research revealed that yes, he was part of the 14th Waffen SS Grenadier, Galicia Division, which changed its name to the 1st Ukrainian Division to distract attention from its origins. But clearly this was not only an international embarrassment, this was a horrendous act by Justin Trudeau. And I blame Justin Trudeau, not just the Speaker of the House, former Speaker of the House, Anthony Rota. Has there been any meaningful fallout? Have there been any consequences beyond, I saw the Speaker of the House taking responsibility as though he had overruled the Prime Minister's office to make it happen? No, this is what's so frustrating, Neil, is that Justin Trudeau has continued to distract attention from him. He never wants to take responsibility or accountability for his own idiotic decisions. And the fact that he's supposed to be the leader of Canada, he forgets that when it's convenient to do so. He has blamed the speaker. He threw the speaker under the bus. The speaker took the bullet for him. And then he has the gall to suggest this is all somehow related to Russian propaganda and Russian misinformation. But we now know, Neil, that the daughter-in-law of Mr. Yaroslav Hunka was posting on the very day he appeared a picture of Hunka waiting to meet with Justin Trudeau and Vladimir Zelensky. So clearly both of them knew he was coming. Both of them were very approving of it. And they all were in on this together. It is. It, it's a story that leaves, I think, most of us breathless <laughs> with disbelief, really. But to, to, to park that there for the moment, and you know, I've, I've really invited you along this evening to talk about the the, the protest, the, the the million people, however it was badged up, the, the strong protest in Canadian towns and, and cities. Um, it, it, what was it that what was it that pulled those people out onto the streets? Well, this was a remarkable event in Canadian history, and I, I called it that. I don't know if we have ever had an event that attracted so many people. There were not just a million people marching, and it was billed as the one million march for children. There were probably about a one and a half million people across Canada, from Halifax to Vancouver, who were out marching, and it was an all-faith march. We had Muslims, evangelical Christians, Roman Catholics, Jews, Hindus, Sikhs. We had people from all faiths, and it was a non-partisan event. Some political parties wanted to capture the event. The organizers insisted everyone was welcome. And that's one of the reasons I became so involved in this, because it was nonpartisan, and I wanted to applaud my Muslim friends, for finally energizing Canadians to get off of their seats and to go into the streets and to say we've had enough of this gender ideology in our schools. We've had enough 
of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, provincial governments, school trustees, and teachers unions saying they know best for our children. The state knows best and parents butt out. And it's time to say no. And so many parents feel the same way right now. What what is the situation since you raise that that the dichotomy? You know, is it the it, when it comes down to it, is it the family or is it the state in Canada that says what goes when it comes to children? And and do the parents have to be made aware of what decisions have been made about children? Well, currently there are only two provinces because education in Canada is a provincial mandate, you know, unlike in the UK. It is a provincial mandate. So we only have two premiers standing up against what is essentially a denial of parents to even know if children under this age of 16 decide to change their gender and their pronouns. New Brunswick and Saskatchewan are fighting back. The rest of the provinces are allowing a system where parents are not even allowed to know, let alone give their permission if children want to do something as consequential as this. And I say children cannot buy a drink. They cannot get a pint of scotch. They cannot buy a firearm. They cannot vote. They cannot drive a car. But somehow the education system says they can make a decision to change their gender, which could lead to chemical castration. I don't know anything more consequential than that. It's a lot more consequential than buying a pint of scotch. David, bear with me. I have guests in the studio that I'd like to involve in this in this conversation. Um, Greg, how do you react to that? You know, this idea that it's up to the state and not the parents how, how children uh, are, how they exist outside the home. It's completely outrageous. And it's another example of the government and these institutions that have either co-opted the government or, or been co-opted by unelected bureaucrats. And also you have the, you know, the academia, for example. So you have all these institutions, but especially the teachers unions that David pointed out and the government that are telling parents, we know best for your children. And that is completely outrageous. And I'm so glad to see the Canadians taking it to the streets. It's not something that, that I would have expected. Um, you know, I always view Canada as, as more liberal or more left-leaning. Perhaps they are. But this is, people have just had enough. Mm. And it happened in the U.S. already. In the last two years, the pushback has been phenomenal. And it's happened here in the U.K. with great organizations like Us For Them. And, and you know, the... Hashtag together. The, yes, exactly. And, and the percentage of people who support this perverse idea that children should be allowed to identify as whatever gender they want, that's gone from 53% support in the U.K. here in 2019 to 30% in 2022. It's happened all over the U.S. as well. It's good news. It, 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 Ingrid, um, it, it was, it, it's of interest to me that uh, it was uh, multi-faith. Yes. You know, that the, that the thing was being driven at the grassroots by Muslims, by, by, by Christians, by Sikhs, by Hindus, whatever, mm. across, the, across that, 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 something, that, that disparate groups mm. found union and unity exactly. in wanting to have and a say about isn't children. Isn't that heartening? Because um, parents are parents. It doesn't matter what colour, what race you are. You do know your children best. The government have no right to control this. And it's exactly right. You can't buy a drink. You can't do all those th things that David mentioned um, until you're 18, in some places 21. But, you know, I think the, the Canadians are really proving themselves. I know exactly what you're saying. But look at the truckers. They were moment. absolutely superb. And it's really, really good that there's a kickback. We need to do that all over the place. Yeah. David, how do, you, how, you know, how do you react to that? You know, this, this strong sense that, um, that, that Canada is really in the thick of it, that there's so much. It's a hotbed of, of controversial ideas. That obviously, the, the truckers' rebellion that was, so, that was so severely quashed and the rest. How, how do you react to the response? Well, I'm, I'm heartened to hear this today. I'm heartened what I'm seeing on social media because unfortunately Canada has been far too much defined by this clown, and I, and I don't use that term loosely, this clown, Justin Trudeau, who embarrasses himself and has embarrassed the entire nation every time he leaves the country. 
and every time he makes domestic policy decisions. But Canadians are all about this million march for children. Canadians were all about the Freedom Convoy that came to Ottawa and demanded the end of COVID-19 mandates. That's what Canada is still all about. Canadians are about free speech and assembly. And that's exactly what Justin Trudeau is trying to destroy. Because mm -hmm. I don't know if you're aware of this. He's introducing Canada's version of the Online Safety Act in the fall. And it's got the same dire ramifications for free speech in this country. But that's not what Canadians are all about. It's, it's fascinating to hear that there's so many of these stories that are, that are taking root in all, in all of our countries and, and that the response to them is, uh, well, energising, I would say. But David Creighton from the Post Millennial, thank you so much uh, for your time this evening. We've been talking about protests in Canada, uh, specifically around the topic of uh, transgenderism and LGBTQ rights, uh, how it affects education and so on, uh, how much say parents ought to have over what their children hear at school. Now, Counter-protests were organised as well, and my next guest tonight was among the organisers of one of those, Fareed Khan of the organisation Canadians uh, United Against Hate. Uh, hello, Fareed Khan, thank you for joining us. Good evening, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, first of all, should parents have the final say on their children's education, or, should, or ought it to be in the hands of the state? and others? Well, I guess it depends on what that education is. If that education involves um, um, indoctrinating the children to hate certain people, to be prejudiced, to be racist, to be bigoted, then no, I don't think that uh, should rest in the hand of the parents. Um, I think that the curriculum, the curriculum that uh, has been developed by experts that has been adopted by ministries of education across the province in conjunction with teaching organizations is well researched and that should be the uh, model that should be used unless of course that curriculum also in some way promotes uh, prejudice or hate. Have, have Canadian children in Canadian schools been being taught in recent times to hate as you suggest? Is that the case? No, they're not being taught to hate. What they're being taught is that we have a diversity in our society, and it includes people of all backgrounds. It includes people of different racial backgrounds, different uh, religious backgrounds, including different gender identities. And the people behind the, the One Million March for Children protests are basically looking at that and saying that, no, we don't want our children to be taught about this diversity. We don't want them to be inclusive. And I think that's dangerous because when hate, when, when that sort of uh, uh, indoctrination by parents saying to their children that, no, you know, these people are, are bad or they're evil, which, by the way, some children shouted in slogans with their parents um, during some of these protests, then I think that's a very dangerous thing to allow to happen. We have hate crime laws in this country, and um, there were some people in different parts of the country who were arrested for promoting hate speech, and I think that should say a lot about where these protests are coming from. Your, your, your organization, yours was one of the organizations uh, involved in the counter-protest, it's called Canadians Against Hate. Uh, did, did you encounter hate on the streets that day? Well, the people from our group who were out in different parts of the country, um, they stood toe-to-toe, -to -toe, counter protesting, and they did see hate. They did see hateful messages. There was one incident uh, where a teenage boy, you know, said, get rid of the gays, um, but continually shouted that. There were people who were stomping on pride flight. Now, we wouldn't allow this sort of protest to happen targeting a religious minority or a racial minority. So why should we allow it to happen um, to target uh, a, uh, a gender? Um, I, took, I take issue with what your previous speaker said, saying that Canadians are behind us. No, Canadians are not behind us. The vast majority of Canadians want a pluralistic and diverse society. In the and um, the counter-protests showed that. In fact, in many places, the counter-protesters were larger in number than protesters. So I think that should be patient. I think, I think what troubles a lot of people is the idea, though, of uh, their children uh, he hearing a message that the parents are not aware of. 
and, and, and furthermore, that, that children are able to uh, take on a, a, a lifestyle or a role or, a, or an identity away from home that their parents don't know about. Do you understand why some parents, particularly from traditional backgrounds, would want to would want to know what their children, how their children were identifying at school? Well, I think that uh, that's a that's misinformation because parents are told what children are being taught in school. And frankly, with regards to teen students, I think that teenagers, once they walk out of the house, they do take on a different identity. I remember growing up as a teenager and the people that uh, I uh, associated with, and they were very different at home, especially if they came from a traditional immigrant background than they were when they were out in public. So these, these teenagers are already you know, changing their identities when they leave their home. So I don't know how this would be any different. If you bear with me, uh, I'd like to involve my, my guests in the studio. Ingrid, do, do you, how do you react to the to the idea that um, that it is up to the state to to take on the role of of telling children these they fundamentals? They have no right. It's all about control. They have no right. We are the parents of children. We know best. Different children have different needs and the parents will identify with those different needs. You cannot blanket. It's not teaching, it's telling. It's life experiences that they will learn about these things, but they won't learn it. And it's not a, a subject in a classroom to be learnt and taught by somebody who hasn't got the ability to do that because they aren't um, well versed in it unless they are um, gay themselves and in, in that sort of like respect. Do you know, it's so dangerous and it's going to break families apart and it's actually going to make children, it's going to really screw up their heads because they won't know if they're Arthur or Martha at a very tender age and that is, where will they go from there? Greg, is there a, how do you feel, I suppose what I'm asking is, is there an age at which it's too young for anyone to be talking to children about these matters, about sex, about gender, about lifestyles? You know, is it something that, that ought to wait until a certain threshold? Absolutely. And guess who should decide that? Mm -hmm. The parents. The parents are the first and best advocates for their children or any children, really. And and this is, you know, this goes back to Edmund Burke's, you know, society's little platoons. The family is the smallest of the platoons. And so the state should not be involved. This sounds, the, the argument sounds like East Germany in the 70s or the Soviet Union or the Chinese where this, the state ruled all and, and people were ratting out their own parents. And, and it's really dangerous. So anytime you disagree... You know, if you want to teach your children about transgenderism, fine, go mm. ahead. There's and you'll know no when your here. child is ready that's anyway. Yeah, that's your that's your choice. Mm. But don't let the state do it. A, a, a final question while I still have you, uh, Farid Khan. Uh, what are the numbers? Uh, you know, and, and, as, and as a, in, in terms of pushing back, you know, it, what it was billed as a, a million people march, a million people. What, you know, when it comes to the counter protest, how, how many were mustered for the for the opposite side of the argument? Well, I think the largest crowds were in the big cities. In Ottawa, we had about 1,000 protesters matched by an equal number of counter protesters. Um, in Toronto, was probably the biggest march, and it was probably a few thousand also marched. Actually, there were more counter protesters in Toronto than there were um, protesters. So the so-called one million people march was actually, you know, maybe, you know, 20,000 people across the country who actually came out to protest. And, and you know, I take it. Just going to have to leave it there, uh, uh, Farid Khan. Just going to have to leave it because I've simply r run out of time. So uh, 